Hey everybody, Dr. Baker here. In this brief lecture, I want to cover the three different types of ways that we characterize analytics projects or analytics displays. You'll notice there's a little asterisk next to the three. That's because I'm actually going to be talking about four. The reason I made this strange distinction here is historically when people were trying to come up with ways to categorize different types of analytics, the three character, uh, the three types that were common were descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive. In more recent years, uh, a fourth type has been introduced, and I think it's it's pretty stable at this point. We could probably fairly say that the, there's, there's more of a four type typology at this point of diagnostic analytics. Uh, I mention this because uh, I encourage you to always, you know, look for other online resources, videos, or tutorials, or anything that might help you um, also understand the course material. And you may certainly see different websites mention three or four different types of analytics. So don't be surprised. Now, in this little video, we're going to do a simple example illustrating each type of analytics in action, and. Again, there's a litany of online resources. You won't have any time finding uh, difficulty finding things if you do a little Googling, but you can also check out this link um, from Harvard Business School online or type this into the search bar and you'll find it quickly if you want a few more uh, examples. So without any further ado, let's imagine a simple sort of running example to illustrate the four different types of analytics that we're going to be talking about today. So first, hey, let's imagine that we are an online clothing retailer. So we are simply just selling a variety of different clothes, men and women's apparel, online. Uh, for now, let's just imagine we have two different types of customer segments. I'll call them customer type A, customer type B. You can imagine what other underlying traits might separate these two customer bases. In addition, our goal for the analytics project is broadly that we want to see how our sales to each segment have performed over time. Okay, so first, Let's take a look at an example of descriptive analytics. So what makes something descriptive analytics? Well, its primary objective is to describe what happened. Notice that it's past tense, right? Uh, and it's also fair to say that all other types of analytics actually build upon descriptive analytics, right? This is not, this is not an either or, it's rather this is a foundation upon which other analytic projects or models are built upon. Um, and the one thing that's going to be enduringly common about any type of descriptive analytics is that it's always backwards looking, AKA historical, right? We're not looking to the future at all. We're just trying to get an accurate depiction of what happened. So let's take a look at this simple trend chart. Now, of course, descriptive analytics could use all kinds of different data displays depending on what the particular project is. Uh, in our case here, a trend chart is going to be appropriate because we want to look at how these two groups have changed over time, right? So if you look on the x-axis along the bottom there, you'll notice we have like month one to month 12. So we're looking at the past year in one month intervals. And on the y-axis, we have these sales for each of the customer segments. So we'll just call it hundreds of dollars for now to keep it simple, but it, of course, could be in the hundreds of thousands or whatever. So clearly, uh, notably, we're not looking to the future. And normally in a descriptive analytics data display, we wouldn't have a blank space there where the future is. But for now, it's useful for us to say, oh, clearly, we are only looking at what happened in the past year, right? So... I mean, what are some basic conclusions that we might draw by just looking at the past, right? We could say that um, segment B continues to be our better, uh, in terms of total sales, uh, better segment. However, it would appear that the change in sales, the delta, right? The slope of this approximate linear line of segment A is, is sharper than segment B. So in other words, it's catching up, right? But again, we don't really know why this happened. We just are simply act, trying to accurately display the past. So that brings us to the next question, right? If you're a marketer, you don't really just want to know what happened in the past immediately. Anytime you see any historical data that's mildly interesting, 
the first question that reasonably comes to mind is, well, why is it that way? Why did that happen, right? So that's where diagnostic analytics comes in. It's the same thing as descriptive analytics, but there's a few additional characteristics. First, it endeavors to add in the this is why it happened aspect, right? So this is what it is and here's why it happened. Now, when I say, you know, here's why it happened, that means we're going to do an analytics project that meant, that is meaning to show causality, right? If this, then that. These, this thing caused that other thing to happen. Now, it's going to be important to keep in mind, both in this example and in your careers, whenever we look at an example of diagnostic analytics, we need to be careful about thinking about what showing causality really means. It's difficult to truly demonstrate causality. So some analytics projects that are showing diagnostic analytics might be literal causality, as in we ran some online experiments like A-B testing, not to be confused with our customer segment A and B, just A-B testing. Google that phrase if you have not heard it before. And we've literally demonstrated that this thing causes that thing to happen through the, through the uh, lab or field experiments that we ran. In many other cases, Diagnostic analytics doesn't definitively show the causal factor, but rather it shows correlations. It suggests causality. You may have heard the phrase that correlation does not prove causality, and that's true. But in some cases, if you have good theory, correlation is suggestive of causality. So diagnostic analytics may be one or the other when it's trying to show so-called causality. Let's look at the example and we'll understand a little better. Okay, so look, it's the exact same chart as before, but remember, we wanted to add that element of why, like why did this occur? So in this case, all we did was we added a little red dot that plots the point in time where we sent out 15% off coupons to our different customer segments, right? So we can see here that in segment A, the blue line, at month three and month eight, we sent them some 15% off coupons. And in the case of segment B, at month six and month 10, we sent some coupons. Now this wasn't and this is something that's not shown on the chart. I would just, we just had to make sure that we know this through having a conversation with the other marketers in our, in our um, company. But there was no like experiment being ran here. They just sent the coupons whenever subjectively from the manager's perspective, it seemed like sales from that segment had kind of slowed. And you can see maybe that manager's intention because right before all of these coupons were launched, you can see a small decline. So in other words, things started slowing down for sales for that particular segment, and then they launched the coupon. And sure enough, in each instance when we launched the coupon, sales picked back up again, right? So did we prove causality? Is this a diagnostic analytics that not only suggests causality, right? It suggests that these coupons actually you know, increase sales again, but it actually prove causality? And the answer is no, right? Showing things that might be causal do not does not prove causality. It's just a good theory, right? I mean, it's reasonable that coupons may have worked, but there's might be other factors in play. So that's what I mean by diagnostic analytics. Like remember, we're only seeing what is being shown. Nonetheless, that is the intent of a diagnostic analytics pro, uh, program. Okay. Now let's move away from the past and start looking towards the future, right? If you're a marketer, yes, we often look at what happened in the past, but hey, hopefully we are more forward-looking individuals, right? We can't change the past. We can merely learn from it and try to improve ourselves looking forward. So that's where something like predictive analytics comes into play, right? Again, it's same as descriptive and maybe diagnostic analytics, but also, and this is the important part, Predictive analytics is looking at what's going to happen in the future, right? We're making a forecast, we're making a prediction of some kind. Um, importantly, whenever we're looking into the future or making a forecast or making a prediction, not only should we say what we think is going to happen, well, the future is always uncertain uh, to some extent, right? We can't be, uh, in most cases, 100% certain when it comes to marketing phenomena, exactly what's going to happen. So predictive analytics should both 
predict what's going to happen in the future and hopefully better versions of it should also show when there's uncertainty or how much uncertainty there is in those predictions. Uh, again, it's one thing to say that you have made a prediction of the future. It's another thing to say you've made a good or sensible or reasonable prediction of the future. So predictive analytics can either be overall high quality or low quality. That's entirely contingent on the underlying quality of the historical data and the quality of the underlying analytical model to make those predictions. So let's just see an example here. Okay, so we're back to our same exact uh, data visualization that we saw previously. But now we see a clear example of a uh, predictive analytics model, right? We can clearly see that the model is predicting a sort of linear increase for customer segment A. That's a linear with maybe sort of a subtle curve, a linear positive, right? And then for the orange group here, segment B, there's clearly just a linear forward looking prediction. Okay. There's no information given to us about exactly how they built these models. So we really can't make a sensible judgment if they did a good or bad job. We just have to kind of take them at their word for now. However, let's add one more little element to this that suggests that maybe the, qual the model has some decent quality, right? If we're looking to the future, we should always know we can't be 100% certain. But if we're careful and we build our models carefully, we can usually at least model the degree of uncertainty, right? We can sort of say, in the future, this is going to happen, and here's how unsure I am of what's going to happen. And knowing your uncertainty is quite good. So look at these little orange sort of cones here, here, right? In both of these, there's kind of an intuition I think I, I would like you to be able to grasp. Notice if we're right here at month 12, like we're closer to currently uh, current time, our degree of uncertainty about the future is pretty narrow. Notice that the width of this uncertainty is relatively small. But as we try to look further and further and further into the future, our uncertainty necessarily gets wider. No surprise. If your intuition is like, hey, it's probably easier to predict what your customers will do, customers will do tomorrow rather than what your customers are going to do two years in the future, you're right. That's exactly what this is trying to convey. So that's, at least in this particular example, this is one positive aspect of this depiction of predictive analytics that we also have, are, have the ability to see the degree of uncertainty. Um, typically, these types of bands, these uncertainty, whether it's depicted just numerically with text or visually, typically we show 95% confidence intervals, but that's not guaranteed. 80% confidence intervals, 90% confidence intervals are all pretty typical but we'll learn about that more as we move uh, later into the semester. Okay, and that brings us to our fourth and final type of analytical model or analytical project, and that is prescriptive analytics. And the way to think about this is us bringing descriptive, diagnostic, and predictive analytics together. So we're gonna use the past, right, descriptive, and we also have an understanding of what caused things to happen. So that's the diagnostic analytics element, right? We know why the past happened. Now, if we know what happened in the past and we know what caused the things in the past to happen, so we know all the if-then relationships, or at least all the big ones, well, that implies not only can we build a forecast of the future, but we also can build a forecast of the future that is conditional, meaning if these different things happen, then the future will look this way versus if these things happen in a different way, then the future will happen a different way. So the idea is if, if we have the ability to understand uh, the causal relationship between these things, we can show a bunch of different future scenarios. And since we can show the future scenarios, managers can pick the best course of action from those scenarios. So let me give a really simple example of prescriptive analytics in action. Okay. Now here, we're looking at the exact same prescriptive analytics chart uh, pro, uh, result that we saw earlier, but there's one little important difference. So this is a very simple example of prescriptive analytics, but it illustrates the point. So here, not only are we predicting what we think is going to happen in the future for segment A and segment B, we're also building a future prediction based on what happens if 
we double the amount of advertising spend that we spend on each segment, right? And certainly we could do a bunch of other examples, but I didn't want to put it all on a chart because it's a little confusing. For us, we're just going to imagine we're doubling our ad spend. And sure, you can absolutely see, at least as far as these models are concerned, that sales is going to go up for both segment A and segment B. Now, which of these choices should the manager do? Well, if the goal is to maximize sales, clearly we should double our ad spending for both segment A and segment B. And in many cases, marketers, often their goal is to maximize sales. Now, ideally, of course, we shouldn't necessarily worry about maximizing sales. We should be trying to maximize profitability. And this would be an example where our prescriptive analytics model, at least as shown right here, can't quite answer the maximize profitability question because we don't actually also have shown to us what it costs to double our advertising spend, right? It costs money to do that. Maybe it won't be as profitable. Um, it's probably fair to say that the doubling of ad spend for segment A, the blue line, is likely to be a better choice. Notice that it kind of increases their sales. It's at least forecasted to decrease their sales much more than the effect that we see in segment B, the orange line here, right? To see the, the, the increase is just a little smaller here. Again, we would have to go dig into additional data, right? to actually ascertain the correct thing if the goal is to maximize profitability. But this still illustrates, at least for our purposes in today's lecture, how prescriptive analytics works. A couple other things I want to point out. I want to show us a few other examples of analytics in other contexts, okay? And very interesting, you know, at the early stages of the pandemic, uh, a lot of individuals, news media, organizations, uh, citizens, we're very interested in starting to understand sort of uh, the impact of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic on populations, illnesses, death, and so on. So let me quickly run through a couple other uh, examples outside of the marketing context to show these sort of analytics uh, in action. So this comes from the CDC. You can go look this up uh, right now. And what we're looking at here is... Uh, Two things first, notice these blue vertical lines. So these blue vertical lines depict the actual real number of total deaths in the United States from all causes, not just, not just the COVID pandemic, all causes. And now what is also true is when it comes to forecasting uh, the number of people in the United States who might uh, perish in any given week, um, actually, it's quite easy to make a reasonably accurate prediction. Uh, it's hard to predict any one individual person passing, but of course, it's pretty easy in the aggregate due to just, just basic demographic phenomena and known causal factors like flu season and so on. So if you look at this orange line here, this little wave, that's a forecast model. That's a model. It's a math algorithm that says, okay, according to a known model based on a certain number of inputs, this is what we think the number of people who would pass away on any given week would be. And of course, since this is a forecast, there's a degree of uncertainty. And the red line that's following the orange line, the wave right above it, is the upper end of that 95% confidence interval. Okay. Now, what do we do with this? Well, how the CDC uses it is it helps us get an understanding of something they call when there's excess deaths. In other words, it's in a situation when more people in the United States pass away than was predicted even by the upper ends of the forecast model. If you look at the far left here, you see these little plus symbols, you can see that the number of people who perished uh, in the early part of 2018 was higher than the model actually had predicted. This is due to a particularly brutal flu season. And if you look up Google News, you'll note this back in the, there were a lot of news articles about this deadly flu season. Unfortunately, of course, also during the peak and second primary wave of the COVID pandemic, there was also a large number of excess deaths. Right, noticeably far exceeding even those of what was known as a crippling flu season in the United States. So here's where we see good, strong, clear, unfortunate evidence that the effect 
of the of COVID on uh, human mortality in the United States was much higher than would have otherwise been expected based on historical norms. Okay, so for our purposes, how would we characterize this types of analytics project? It is descriptive in the sense there's historical data being shown. Is it diagnostic? Is it telling us why? Well, this is where we have to be cautious. We can't definitively know. Uh, we, we, we can't run an experiment on the United States and test, you know, infecting people purposely with the COVID, pan, uh, the COVID, with COVID or not. So we can't run a true experiment, nor would we ever want to, uh, and see what the effect on mortality is. Yet there's strong theoretical and literally biological reasons to know that, yes, this is almost certainly most of this excess death is probably due to direct and indirect causes from the COVID pandemic. Is it predictive? Yes, it is also predictive in the sense that we see these orange and red wavy bars, right? These are these are actually future forecasts. It's kind of hard to uh, understand this right now. It's these were past looking future forecasts. Yeah, we'll get more into how the how those sort of past looking future forecasts work and helps us understand genuinely predicting the future with more sensibility. Now, is it prescriptive? Definitely not prescriptive. There's nothing here inherently in the model that tells us what we ought to have done to change the course of um, excess deaths in the United States. It's not a judgment of whether it's good or bad. It's just this is the reality of what the goal of this particular analytics project was. I'll take another look at a forecast model. This is a model, this is genuinely trying to look forward. There was a whole bunch of different researchers uh, that were trying different ways of trying to predict uh, caseloads and um, fatalities due to COVID-19 throughout the course of the pandemic. And it turns out that predicting precise numbers of people getting infected and people perishing in a pandemic situation is extremely hard. Um, there's enormous numbers of difficulties because of data quality, there's analytic challenges and the, the small variations in picking your little math parameters to try to predict something that could be exponential uh, is just leads to a lot of uncertainty. And even after all these years, with lots more data now being generated to understand um, you know, the likely impacts of people perishing due to different phenomenon being measured, there's two models that are being shown here. I just happened to select two of these many models that researchers have been building. These two models notice that those little dotted beads here show their exact predictions for up, for a short upcoming window of time, number of fatalities related to COVID. First of all, notice they're both separating. They disagree. One says it's going to go down. One says it's going to go a bit up, even in the short term. But then also notice both of them have extreme amounts of uncertainty. They are both sort of acknowledging this lack of confidence that they even have, even after all these years with all this data, in what is likely to happen in the future um, going forward. Now, if I had showed you an earlier version of these models, these uncertainty, these uncertainty widths were going to be would be much, much, much larger. Fortunately, just because you have uh, all the best intention in the world, the data challenges sometimes makes future forecasting extremely challenging. One last example. Uh, of a different analytics project is I wanted to show you one example of a, somebody or a team who's attempted to generate a uh, prescriptive analytics model related to COVID-19. So what are we looking at here? If we look in the upper left, we can see this is a model that shows different types of interventions that states or national uh, state or national governments could impose as an attempt to try to mitigate the uh, COVID pandemic. So for example, I just selected this just to show, you say, okay, one intervention is like a true lockdown and you'd have to go look at the actual dashboard of what, an, what they actually define as a lockdown because lockdown can mean different things. Uh, and we do it for eight weeks. And then after that, you stick with whatever the current intervention policies are. Let's say that. It also has you pick up here, like, well, what is the vaccine effectiveness, right? When you're fully vaccinated, um, efficacy of a vaccine can vary due to the vaccine itself, variations in uh, uh, the virus as we progress, and so on and so forth. And it says, okay, if you do these things, then 
based on the model, this is what is predicted to be the likely outcome, number of new COVID deaths, number of cumulated number of people diagnosed, right? So if you look at the little, the, the darker lines are showing what actually happened. And these like gray lines are the prediction and the uh, confidence interval. And what makes this a, an example of prescriptive analytics, again, is that you have the ability to sort of toggle different scenarios, sort of causal interventions, right? If you do this, then it'll do this on the prediction. If you want to check it out, I encourage you to go ahead and just Google and check out this uh, actual website, and you can play around with the simulation tool itself. And again, um, whether or not this is an accurate prediction of the future or prescriptive um, depiction of the future kind of depends on a variety of factors that is a little outside the control of at least this lecture, but gives you an example of analytics in action elsewhere. Hey everybody, I hope you enjoyed our discussion related to the three, oh I'm sorry, four different types of analytics that we see in marketing analytics and other fields. Um, my hope going forward here is that whenever we see examples of analytics in action in marketing or elsewhere, we're capable of sort of slotting them into one of these four different categorizations. Why is that important? It's not just so on a later quiz I can ask you to sort of put things in place, but rather by understanding what a current analytics project is capable of, it makes us better suited to understanding what the results can or cannot tell us. In addition, it helps us spot where we as users or understanders of analytics mo analytic models should be looking out for places where there might be problems. For example, in prescriptive analytics models, we know that we have to be a little more concerned with the underlying algorithm, like how did that future looking uh, prediction actually come to be? If we're looking at a diagnostic analytics model, we should be asking questions like, is it showing us the likely most important causal factors? Or is it possibly hiding from us inadvertently other underlying factors that might have explained these historical results that we're seeing? So by able to being able to categorize these things, we'll be a little more educated and capable at making a reasonable critique and evaluation of analytics modules. Okay, see you in class and see you in the online chat. Take care, everyone.